Okay, another important thing when you use a biosafety hood, uh, uh, disposing uh, the waste material, okay? So you have to have some kind of trap or waste uh, container inside of a hood. So while you're using the clean walk space inside a hood, you're not going to contaminate your material there. Okay, if you're using a lot of liquid waste there, it may be better to use some kind of filter that's going to trap your waste, liquid waste, so you're not going to make any splashes and things like that. So make sure you use some kind of uh, disposal waste container uh, in your workspace. Okay, and then, of course, when you walk in there, so you have to wear gloves. You're not going to use your bare hands inside the hood because your skin is full of, you know, microbials and you, you tend to shed those and spread those. So, of course, you have to wear gloves. And then between your lap gown and uh, glove, of course, you have exposed skin. So to cover that, uh, I normally recommend you to put on the sleeves, right? So cover your skin exposure by putting on your gloves and sleeves. And normally, gloves and sleeves are, you know, um, waterproof so you can spray your glove and sleeve with the sanitizer as well so thoroughly spray them and before you put your uh, hands and arm in the workspace of course right and then when you operate inside the work area you know that should be neatly organized and so you you think about your operation so your right hands your left hands and whichever you're going to use like think about you pipetting something you're going to hold your pipette on right hand then where should, should you place your pipette tip box okay so you don't want to put that on the left hand side you probably want to keep it on a right hand side somewhere so you don't want to uh, prevent the crossing of your hand over your material so think about that you know organization when you place your materials in your workspace okay so it should be arranged so you'll have a proper airflow and the workflow that will minimize contamination so some uh, neat organization is needed there and then once your work is done, of course, you're going to remove your materials uh, from the workspace to outside. Uh, make sure that you know you clean up uh, your materials. You don't have to spray when you bring them outside, but you have to make sure that they are you know completely covered up, so you're not going to contaminate them when you bring them out. And then once you uh, done with the using the workspace you have to of course clean up same way you have to spray them you have to wipe them up and during that time the airflow should continue okay about 15 minutes of operation again okay and then some biosafety hoods are equipped with uv light and you know you can use uv light uh, to get rid of whatever the you know the contaminants they may be in there but uh, you need to be careful. You don't want to trust that too much. Uh, you, you can you don't you can assume that the UV light killed that everything. So when you try to use the biosafety, you don't have to wipe up. No, that's not the case. You know, UV lights are kind of a, you know auxiliary device. If you want to use them, you can use it, but I wouldn't trust that 100. percent So although UV light um, germinate, I mean the cleaning you can do but you know you still have to wipe up the workspace and you still have to turn on the blower at least 15 minutes before your operation okay and then you you can walk in the workspace okay it's a kind of optional you know device the uv light uh treatment is and then minimize the tra uh, traffic around the biosafety hood uh, to avoid any air draft Okay, especially don't you don't want to put that right next to the door uh, where airflow will happen uh, very strongly Okay, so those are kind of common sense. Okay, so keep this in mind when you were asked to uh, do something using a biosafety hood. Okay, so the exercise number one, uh, you will be asked to do some work inside of a biosafety hood, especially microfiltration. Uh, you're going to ask to perform a microfiltration or a, I guess uh, uh, aseptic filtration exercise later on. When you do that, make sure you clean up the my, my biosafety hood work area uh, and then, you know, organize the workspace and then carry out the work. And once you are done, you know, you clean up and as you just learned. Okay, so understand the principle of biosafety operation. That's the first part. 
And then the second part. Uh, so this diagram shows you the drug substance and drug product manufacturing. So drug substance manufacturing is made up with upstream processing and downstream processing, of course, uh, after that. Uh, so this is downstream as well. So uh, upstream and um, clarification, downstream, and then drug product uh, manufacturing, which is beginning with the uh, formulation and then, um, I guess, uh, filling and all those things uh, from taking place there. So, so this is uh, upstream uh, uh, clarification, downstream operation. That's what you see. So the point of this diagram is I want you to focus on uh, filter uses during this operation. Okay, so if we look at this diagram, how many filters are there? Can you identify? So something about media filtration, so those are the filters. Okay, and the air filtration, those are the filters. Aeration, seems like there are another, a lot of filters there during the uh, upstream operation. And then um, during the filtration, uh, this clarification, yeah, you use something like depth filtration to remove large chunky cell waste, right? And then you may be using TFF, tangent flow filtration to the buffer um, exchange. Uh, centrifugation is a standalone process, but here during the, you know, chromatography operation in the downstream process, there's something like sterile grade uh, uh, liquid filtration happening, buffer filtration is happening, another sterilization grade liquid filtration happening, buffer filtration, buffer filtration, viral removal filtration, and then buffer filtration, st sterilizing, stel sterilizing grade filtration. So there are multiple, multiple steps where different types of filters are used during your drug substance manufacturing. That's the focus. So that being said, then it is very important uh, for you to understand the principle of filtration because it is used a lot. Okay, so let's talk about uh, the filtration. So there was a prelude. So filtration is, of course, a separation technique. Uh, it will separate out the, uh, the molecules based on their size difference, right? So the initial material, okay, will uh, be applied to the filter filter surface, and the filter will have a pores uh, with certain sizes. Uh, anything that's smaller than pore will go through as a filtrate. Filtrate means you know they are filtered through the pores, right? And anything that's larger will be retained on the filter surface, trapped. So those are called uh, retentate. So retentate are the large molecules, and the permeates are small molecules that are going through the filter, right? Uh, but it uh, depends on how you're going to filtrate. Uh, if you uh, push your initial material uh, directly towards the filter surface, we call Call that a normal flow filtration or dead end flow filtration because you see the clogging of retentate right away. So when you have this much clogging, your filter cannot be used anymore, right? So that's a kind of waste. You have to replace this filter out so many times. But if you, instead, if you are applying the force kind of perpendicular to your filter design, you know that's going to minimize. Uh, the clogging, that and the clogging of your retentate material. Okay, so we call that a tangent flow filtration. So there are two types of filter operation. One is called normal flow filtration, which is a dead end, but the other one is called tangent flow filtration, which is a continuous parallel filtration that minimizes the clogging problem, dead end problem. Okay. And then uh, different size of filter pores and how effective they are to filter out different molecules. So microfiltration that uses microfilter that has size, pore size about 0.05 to 1 micron size, those are effective in removing uh, living cells, okay, except for maybe microplasma and viruses. Viruses are small, smaller than, you know, living cells like bacterial cells, so they'll go through microfilter. Okay, so if you want to remove viruses using a filter, you have to use a viral filter that have much smaller pores, like smaller than 0.5 uh, micron size pores. And then proteins could be also sought out based on the size differences if you have a, a filter that have very small pores. Okay, so yeah, like ultra filters, nano uh, filters, uh, they are named uh, that way because the pore size are much smaller. Okay, understand that? And a similar thing, you know, so all these contaminants of different kind, yeast cell, bacterial cells, you know, pollens, plant cells, and animal cells, red blood cells, uh, can be removed effectively you know, using a microfiltration, okay, so that's about 0.2 micron, 
okay but still viruses or endotoxins pyrogens can go through uh, your microfilter so if you want to remove those you may have to use something uh, filters that has a much smaller pores like maybe nanofilters and things like that reverse osmosis uses maybe nanofilters okay okay so the lab 2 exercise is about your use of microfilter in removing bacterial cells Okay, so, so uh, microfiltration to remove or capture bacterial cells. Maybe you can consider that as an aseptical filtration because you can use the same filter for you know, sterilization method. So we have a syringe tip uh, attachable small filters. We call the syringe attachable disc filters. Uh, those filters have 0.2 micron pore size. That's why they are considered as microfilters. And then since they, they have 0.2 micron pores, uh, and then uh, E. coli, the bacteria, and the gram-negative bacteria are much larger than 0.2 micron. So if you try to uh, filter out E. coli cells using this filter, yes, you can do that. So in the lab, uh, you should have uh, E. coli cell culture uh, that has plenty of E. coli. Okay, you, try to, you will try to remove E. coli cells from that culture medium and see if your microfilter will be efficiently really capturing and removing uh, microfilters from media, uh, the liquid medium. That's what you're going to try. Okay, so you're going to measure the effectiveness of microfiltration in removing E. coli cells from its medium. Okay, so if it can do that, then yes, you can remove bioburdens that are made of bacterial cells using the same filter. So you will be asked to microfilter about 10 milliliter of liquid sample that may have E. coli cells in them. Okay, so once the filtration is done, uh, the uh, the filtrate and the, the the liquid that has gone through filter uh, should not have any cells. So you're gonna test that by streaking some of that filtrate on a petri dish plate and grow them. Also, the retentate, what's captured in your disc filter disc, you can scrape up some of those retentate and streak on the plate and see if you can see the cells. So uh, that's but what we need to do. So the aseptic microfiltration of E. coli cells, uh, that's what you need to do. And then strict uh, the result, retentate and the permeates. Okay, that's the lab exercise two. And then another one uh, you, you're going to learn about uh, today is the centrifugation. Centrifugation is an instrument and they can also separate out uh, molecules based on uh, the particle size difference, particle size difference. So centrifuge can spin um, the samples located in its rotor. Okay, rotor is designed uh, device. It can hold the samples, okay, sample tubes or sample bottles. And it can spin at high speed. And then when it presents the high speed, it creates a sedimentation, uh, the centrifugal force. And centrifugal force will be hitting uh, the, uh, the the molecules that are located inside the sample uh, holders, like uh, bottles or tubes, and the amount of centrifugal force applied to your molecules uh, will be uh, related to the sizes. The bigger the uh, size of the molecules are, they will receive more centrifugal force, so they will come down, push down to the bottom of the tube or bottle so they come down as uh, something called pellet okay pellet is what uh, the molecules that are settling down at the bottom of your sample holder and the things that are lighter smaller will be still suspending in a liquid sample okay so that's how you can separate a different molecule based on the sizes okay so when you centrifuge uh, your sample Okay, you need to consider uh, how much of centrifugal force you're going to apply to your sample, right? So centrifugal force that you'll apply is uh, related to the size of the centrifuge. What I mean by size of centrifuge is the size of the rotor. So how widely it's spinning, okay? And, and then uh, radius, that, that's what I meant. The radius could determine the size of your rotor design, right? And as well as the speed of your centrifuge. Speed is expressed as revolution per minute. Every minute, how many you know times it's spinning. So those two things will determine the, si the uh, size of the force, that are the centrifugal force that will apply to your centrifuge, okay, the, the samples, okay?